Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Heath. Heath, welcome to the show. Hello, Vic. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. You know, we appreciate your time. Heath, please give us a brief bio on yourself. All right. Well, I'm about to turn 38 years old in September. I was born in Paradise, California. I grew up in Northern California. I moved to Oregon in 2000 uh, upon graduating high school. I enlisted in the United States Army. I did uh, two years of active duty as an infantryman. I was stationed at Fort Hood. Unfortunately, I, I signed up for three years active, eight inactive, or uh, five inactive reserve, excuse me. Unfortunately, I, I sustained an injury that ended my career, and so I ended up getting out about 10 months early of that three-year obligation. But at any rate, I came back to Oregon, and I've been here ever since. I love the Pacific Northwest, and I'll probably never leave. And that's really about it. My greatest passion is to fish. Uh, it's been that way since I was probably five years old. I love to pick wild edible mushrooms, and I'm an avid outdoorsman. And uh, that's about it. My life's pretty uneventful other than that. Well, it may be uneventful, but it sounds like it's a very well-rounded life. And thank you so much for your service to our country. I'm so sorry to hear about your injury, though. Oh, it's quite all right. It's my pleasure. Thank you for that acknowledgement, Vic. It means the world to veterans like myself. Oh, you're welcome. It's the least I can do, though. Heath, you said that fishing has always been your greatest passion. After having the four encounters you're going to tell us about tonight, how did that affect your interest in fishing? It, it really didn't, to be perfectly honest with you. There's just nothing that I will allow to stop me from that. It's been that way, like I said, since I was five years old, and I can't imagine it any other way. Well, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that you're still going out and doing what you love to do. That's really good news. All of your four encounters happened at Stillhouse Hollow Lake in Texas. What can you tell us about the lake and the area where it's located? Well, Stillhouse Hollow Lake, it's near uh, Harker Heights, Texas, which is uh, not too far outside of Colleen, Texas, where I resided at the time. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Stillhouse Hollow Lake. Uh, I believe it connects to the Lampasas River there. And I heard through the grapevine that it was a great place to catch crappie and channel catfish, that there was largemouth bass in there and uh, a fish that I had never caught, which is a alligator gar. That being said, I was all over it. And then as it turns out, it was an excellent dove and uh, duck hunting area as well, and which I enjoyed doing as well. So. I would go out there as often as I could when I did have free time, and uh, it's a beautiful area. It was certainly new to me, and there was that eerie feeling out there, though, and it's about all I can say about that. It sounds like a beautiful area, but from what I understand, there are other dangers in that area besides dogmen. Please expand on that for us. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's some feral hogs out there. It was my first experience with them. I really hadn't had any problem. I've heard some horror stories about them, but they're certainly out there, and I understand them to be a nuisance animal, and uh, they're pretty destructive, and they're taken over. They breed fast, and they're hard to stop. Yeah, that they are. Did anything strange happen to you there before you had your first eyes on encounter? Yeah, um, there's a few things. I remember when... The first time that I, I went out to this particular location, okay, and you had to go down this little gravel road, and at the end of the gravel road, there was a uh, kind of a little parking area. It's big enough for maybe three or four vehicles, and then from there, you had to get out and proceed on foot. Now, before you get to that little parking area, you'd be on your right-hand side if you were traveling towards the parking area. There was a house there that seemed to have been lost in time, and to the best of my recollection, it was you know, like a teal blue or a, a faded baby blue in color home. And there was an old vehicle out there. It looked like it was, uh, we used to call them tuna boat. 
and it looked like an old Buick or something, but uh, it was quite long car and quite old. You could tell by the body style. And it was almost like someone just up and left. And, you know, knowing what I know now about the area through my experiences, I wonder if, you know, it had something to do with that. Yeah, as the listeners are going to find out after they listen to your encounters, there might be something behind that. You never know. After having four encounters with them, do you think they're flesh and blood or ethereal? I absolutely do believe they're flesh and blood, uh, 100%, undoubtedly. They're flesh and blood as real as you and me, uh, animal. And I feel like they're part of God's creation, no different than any of us. And, uh, you know, I don't mean them harm. I, I feel like they have the right to exist just like us. I absolutely do believe they're flesh and blood, yes. Yeah, when you ask an eyewitness that question, it's basically a toss-up. You never know what they're going to say. Seems like half think that they have to be ethereal, and the other half, they're convinced they have to be flesh and blood. It's always interesting to see how someone responds to that. You had quite a bit of trouble sharing your encounters with me when we had our first conversation. Did you feel relief after that conversation, or was there not all that much relief after we got done? Yeah, I did. I did have a lot. I had a lot more trouble than I, I thought I would. It, it was just very difficult to once I got started to get into it to rehash all of that. And and you know, and, and keep in mind, I mean, this all happened uh, nearly twenty years ago, and I hadn't spoken of it to anyone other than uh, briefly to uh, my counselor. And uh, I did mention a small portion to my mother. I don't know how much she uh, bought the whole idea, but uh, for what it was worth, she did listen. But after uh, speaking with you and uh, sharing it with you, I, I did feel a, a great level of relief and uh, the perspective that you gave me helped immensely as well. Oh, good. I was hoping it would have helped you. As the listeners are going to find out when they listen to what you've been through, it's totally understandable why you would have trouble talking about those encounters. But I guess instead of delaying, we should probably get into them now. Please give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. Thank you, Vic. Yeah, like I said, I had uh, four separate encounters. The first one was probably the loudest and uh, the one that stands out the most. This is where I realized that these were not wild hogs. Uh, I mean, definitively, there was no denying it after this. And uh, the way it was is, uh, you know, I'd gone out to this place, like I mentioned previously. Uh, I go out there catfishing and uh, duck hunting. And, and regardless of whether I was fishing or hunting, I mean, I always went armed. I always had a, my 12-gauge shotgun, and uh, that's just the way it was. And this occasion was no different. And uh, the way it is, is, like, the best way I can describe it, it's a series of clearings that are bordered by thickets. A lot of grassy field. There's a lot of cactus out there. you got to be careful of the cactus because, I mean, it's, it's pretty rough stuff. It will penetrate your boots if you, you kick it just the wrong way, and it can be pretty painful. And there is like, when you first walk in, you pull up in the parking area and you, um, there's a gate and you have to proceed by foot from that point. And it's a good, I've been out there a few times to recon the area and just kind of check it out. And I found a spot, uh, it was a good 300 yards or so from the parking area. And uh, you had to go through at least three of these clearings or fields. And so I had gone out there and, uh, you know, and I found this spot, and it, the way it is, is like, it's kind of like a slough that comes in off of a portion of the Lampasas River there, and uh, it, there's like a, if you're looking straight across the slough from where my position would be, it was just a great spot for catfish. It, it was my preferred spot, and uh, if you're looking straight across, on the other side of this little finger, um, is, is the lamp passes forever, the main flow of it. And this little finger, uh, kind of separates the slough from, from the river. And it just snakes along back to the terrain there. And along that finger, I mean, it's very dense brush, you know, a lot of dead trees, dead growth, a lot of shrubs, bushes, that kind of thing, tall grass, bull thistle, a lot of stuff like that. And so on this particular evening, it was, uh, it was getting kind of dark. And uh, it, it was that, that in between where the sun was just setting down on the horizon and, you know, the, the light level starts to fade. It was pretty peaceful and I was pretty intent on what I was doing. I had my 
rod all baited up and casted in. Um, I had the little jingle bell on the end of the, of the rod in case I, uh, I didn't catch the bite out here, you know, and, uh, and I was pretty focused on what I was doing. And that's when it happened. It was just, just huge, god awful ruckus, screeching and screaming and branches breaking, twigs snapping. And uh, I mean, it was, it sounded like something was just being murdered over there on that finger on the other side of the slough from me. And it's, it's probably a distance of, uh, I'd say 30 yards across. I mean, it wasn't real far across, but it was getting quite dark. And, uh, I could see the movement through the brush, but it was obscured by the brush. And uh, there was definitely two things in there. And it was either uh, just the worst fight you'd ever heard. And I, I, I really did. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was these wild hogs. Cause like I said, I'd, I'd seen them out there. So I knew they were there. You know, I didn't know I have any idea what else it could possibly be. And so that's what I thought. And this went on for a little while until I, I actually got quite annoyed with the noise. And uh, for whatever reason, I decided to yell at them. And pretty much, you know, uh, it, it might have been, you know, the, the wording was, I'm sure, quite optional. But, uh, you know, I'll try to keep that clean. You know, basically just for them to knock it off and, and to uh, quiet down. And uh, not that they're really going to listen to me. You know, I don't know what I really expected out of that. But I yelled at them, you know, two or three times. And it kept on and kept on, and then they heard me, and it just went silent. Everything stopped. It was almost like they completely forgot what they were fighting about over there or what was going on. I mean, it just stopped. And then what happened next, that, that's when I, I realized that this was not wild hogs. Um, they, uh, they approached the, the edge of the thicket there. There was two of them. And there was definitely two of them. And they don't, they were both about the same size, uh, same profile, same color. Uh, of course it was getting dark, but, uh, and they were black, absolutely black. And, uh, they approached the edge of that brush and they stood up. And so, you know, I'm, I'm at the time I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, process what it is that, that is happening here. Uh, other than the note that it's certainly unusual, I don't I don't know that pigs can stand, um, not to my knowledge. And so I knew I was looking at something quite different. And then, uh, you know, the arms and hands, both of them did it. I mean, it was almost like twins doing it at the same time, like a mirror image. They both did it, and um, they used their arms and hands out in front of them to pull the brush down so that they could look at me and they, they there was no no growling no noise it was just they were they were focused on me they were looking at me and uh from where i was i was very exposed i mean i'm sure they could see me quite well far better than i could see them and i could only see them from probably mid chest up and just to the level that, that the brush was pulled down with their with their arms and um and it was just like it was kind of it almost kind of looked like like uh the character batman in in a movie uh like two of them standing there side by side the way the way his helmet was with the the bat ear sticking straight up and uh and it was more or less just a silhouette uh, at that range i couldn't make out a whole lot of features uh i didn't see really any eye shine or anything like that because i mean i wasn't i didn't i don't think I even had a flashlight with me and so I really didn't have anything to shine at him or anything like that and it was getting quite dark I could just see the the general shape but it was enough to to you know I mean I could tell it I could tell you what it wasn't and ha hearing other others uh encounters you know pretty well figured out what that is now and so that that was pretty well enough for me I, I just became suddenly aware at that moment that Whatever it was over there, uh, I, I didn't know, really know what it was. I didn't. I knew what it wasn't, and I wasn't prepared for it. Uh, was my assessment on that deal? So I went ahead and uh, got out of dodge on that deal, and it was getting dark, so I was going to take my leave shortly anyway. So that that was pretty well that one. Now, the next one was on a separate occasion. I had gone back out to the same area, and it was very brief. And uh, the way it is, uh, it's like 
I was when I was walking up to this this favorite spot of mine. There's kind of a terrain feature that I could only describe as like a a ditch, kind of a natural form ditch, and uh, it was uh, bordered by the same type of thicket foliage, uh, small you know trees and bushes and that kind of thing. But there was a there was certain areas in it where you could see between the bushes and, and kind of underneath into this ditch, and I caught movement. Uh, and this would have been to my right side, you know, as I was traveling to this fishing spot. And it was during dove season. And I looked over, and and this one, uh, it was it was it was a different one. It was definitely different. It was black, but uh, this one did not stand up. It was on all four, but I could tell it was a little bit on the older side because it had a little bit of gray going on there in the face, and um, it didn't show any aggression towards me. I did my. I, I was aware that it was there, um, and it was parallel to me. Uh, it was headed in the same direction I was. There was no growling, no aggression, and it was probably four, four to five seconds that that happened, uh, and I pretty well just ignored it and went to where I was going. And that was it on that. It was very brief, very short, but I I couldn't help but notice. And um, so that that was the second uh, encounter, and and that was uh. It was in the evening, but I mean, it was still quite daylight out. So, I mean, I would call it a daytime uh, encounter. And it wasn't at real close range, but it was close enough to see the color and the size. Uh, I couldn't see the feet, like the, the uh, inverted backwards legs uh, that are described. I wasn't able to see those kind of features. I couldn't see the hands. Mainly, I could just see the mid body up you know, the back, uh, and it was very brief. Uh, I was not trying to get a super good look. I just kind of wanted to go my way. It seemed to want to go its way and, uh, we didn't bother each other. And, uh, that was just fine with me. And so I, I went to my spot and, uh, you know, I, I didn't find any real, real good hunting that day. Um, and, uh, that was pretty much, uh, that encounter. Now my third encounter, and, and, and I, I really greatly suspect that it's the same two from the first encounter. They were about the same size. They were the same color. Now, the only, the only real difference uh, is this, this was also during dove season. And it wasn't far from the parking area where I had parked. Uh, I just went kind of a short distance uh, across this, uh, the first clearing there. And um, at any rate, I had seen them. They were moving away from me. There was two of them. And they were also on all four. They were at a range of probably 150 yards out. And um, I could tell they were intelligent. I know they're intelligent. They were very aware of my presence. They knew exactly where I was. And it was almost like it was almost like they enjoyed the fact that I was watching them. And I, I did. I got curious. I wanted to. I just wanted. I, I was curious. I wanted to observe. Uh, it's probably not smart. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it. I was just. I wanted to get a get a longer look at them, and uh, um, I was very curious. And so I decided to follow them a little ways, and um, they stayed quite a distance from me. They weren't moving real fast, but it was just fast enough to stay about the even 100, 150 yards in front of me. And I could tell, though, by their head movements, it wasn't a full-on turn all the way back and look at me, but it was kind of a halfway turn and look at me. And the, the lead, that one was a little bit further ahead than the other. And they were heading towards, uh, to the left of this clearing, uh, it's where the, the river kind of snakes around, snakes around from your, your 12 o'clock position to, uh, to your left hand side there. And in that area, and I don't, it looked like kind of a, kind of a sort of an orchard to me. And these trees were kind of, there was a little bit of a dome underneath them. They were all the same type, and uh, it just reminded me of an orchard, the way they were spaced and just the whole nine. And uh, anyway, I trailed them clear up to that uh, that point, and uh, I lost sight of them. They went in. They went in there, and the way that was is, uh, even though it was daylight, there was once once you I kind of knelt down to kind of look at, get a better look and see in there, and and they were gone. I mean they. It was like they just went in there and disappeared. I never saw them again. But uh, it was almost like they were leading me that way. Like they knew I was following them. And, and it was almost like they enjoyed it for whatever weird reason. 
uh, which did, did kind of make me a little bit uncomfortable, you know, uh, and the look of that orchard in there, I mean, it was, it was quite low light in there, even despite the fact that, that it was, you know, broad daylight and, uh, it was just, it was just too eerie. Uh, there was always an eerie feeling to that area. There always was, it was just a thick in the air, eerie feeling. Um, especially when you're out there alone, quite often I would go alone. Uh, there's a few times I took my wife with me. Um, but after I encountered these things, I didn't take her. And there's a couple of times I took a friend, but more often than not, I'd go alone. And, uh, and I was by myself this particular time. And so, you know, my, my instincts pretty well kicked in on that deal. I wasn't going, I was not going to go in there. I just had the feeling that, uh, I was headed for trouble on that deal. And, uh, I didn't like that feeling. And so, you know, I trusted my gut on that. I didn't go in there and, uh, I pretty well just turned around and, and uh, headed back to the car and, um, called it a day. And, uh, I, I really do feel like that was the same two that I'd seen before. And I kind of get the feeling that they were, I, I want to say that they were like, I mean, not that I really know anyway, I'm just, just speculating at this at best, but, uh, I, I want to say they were siblings, like brother and sister or something. That's kind of the feeling I got. And so at any rate, yeah, I, I did, I wasn't going in there. I just didn't like the way it looked. I didn't like the way it felt. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I had no idea really what it was I was dealing with. I just knew I wasn't prepared for it. But all the same, I was still very, very curious. And so that, that was pretty well that encounter. Now, the fourth encounter, this was uh, towards the winter. This was during duck season. And uh, I had uh, traveled around. I was trying to find duck decoys. And uh, it just ended up being a situation. I had to travel to a town called Belton. Uh, to a sporting goods store out there. I had a great deal of trouble finding decoys. I was looking for mallard uh, decoys, and uh, they were out of them everywhere, including this this uh, sporting goods store. And it was like a 45-minute drive to get there. So when I got there, the best the best that they had uh, was a box of uh, pintail duck decoys, and so I went ahead and elected to get a box of those. And uh, and I picked up a... Uh, it was supposed, it was advertised on the box as a two person inflatable raft. And it's kind of funny. I spray painted it camouflage and it was like bright orange and stuff. And I, I, I didn't have a, a dog to fetch ducks for me, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and it, you know, you don't want it. It's cold that time of year, even in Texas, uh, you know, you get wet, you get cold and you're miserable and, and, and you're done pretty much. And, uh, and so it was, a, it was, a kill two birds with one stone for me. I could deploy my, my decoys that way with the raft and I could fetch my ducks. If I did get one, they fell in the water, you know? And so, uh, on this particular, uh, time out there, you know, I, I went out there, uh, it was still dark, probably about five in the morning, went out there and, uh, got the raft out, blew it up. And, uh, it was quite the task to, uh, to do this in the dark and, and, uh, to get out there and get set up and I mean, the cactus I'm, I took, I mentioned, uh, it, it took quite a while to get, get out there on foot is what I'm saying. And uh, I was trying to be careful. I did not want to get a foot full of that cactus and, uh, that'd make for a bad day too. And so, uh, I finally get out there and, uh, I got the wrap blown up and, uh, in the water. And, uh, so I went ahead and, and set out my decoys and, uh, picked out the spot there. Um, usually it's the same spot that I used to catfish at. And the way it was, is there was a nice little, like a uh, dead log. It was off of a dead tree there that had fallen over or something. And, uh, it was a great spot to just cop a squat and sit down. And, uh, and the, the way that the log was, it had kind of a, a piece that came off of it. There was a great spot to rest my, my, uh, my weapon, my shotgun. And, uh, and so, you know, I was, I was being quiet and had my hand warmer going and, uh, was waiting for, for the, the light to start to come. And, um, and it was just quiet. It was just quiet and, uh, nothing was really happening. And, uh, a couple hours went by and it got light and no ducks, nothing, wasn't a whole lot going on. And, um, uh, and then it was just like, all of a sudden there it was and it was it was like there's a little i gotta describe the area because it's like there's a when you when you go to walk down this little 
it was kind of like a little grassy spot right right next to the slough there. Um, there was that stump there, and there's kind of a, it's, there's kind of a trail that comes down at a grade. Uh, it's not a real long trail, but I mean it's a well worn trail. I think a lot of animals go down there to, to drink, you know, out, out of the water from that area. So it was pretty well established right there, and it was short, but it was definitely at a at a at an incline and. Uh, so I was in the lower area of that, and the, the top of that trail was a little bit higher from, from where I was. So anything that walked up there, regardless of size, I mean, it's, it's still, you know, uh, you're looking up at it. And um, had my back turned to that. I mean, I was pretty focused. I was waiting for ducks, you know. And uh, I became aware of the presence, and I could hear the breathing. Uh, and I, I really do think that it was the same big one that uh, that I had seen in the ditch uh, the previous time, uh, the real short time I seen that. And uh, it, it was on all four. I didn't want to turn around all the way, but uh, I, I did reach over and grab my weapon and cradled it. Uh, at no time did I draw on it or anything. I, I really didn't have any wish to. Uh, if I had to, yeah, but I mean, I, it just... I, I really don't think it would have done any good. I think that uh, whatever was going to happen was going to happen, and uh, and especially after talking to you, Vic. I mean, you know, you you helped affirm that for me, and so I was able to just kind of give it a just a little corner turn on my head, just enough so that I could see what was there. And I all the, all the while I wanted to believe, and in my mind, I guess it was easier to accept. Uh, that it was, you know, uh, it, it was just a, a big pig, you know, it was a big pig. And uh, he was quite large. He was on all four. I get the distinct feeling it was a male. And I think, I think that uh, for me, it was easier to, it, it helped too uh, when, with his teeth. He didn't bear his teeth at me. He didn't growl at me. He didn't bluff charge me. I mean, there was no real aggression. I mean, it was just kind of a walked up and like, uh, you know, this heavy labored breathing. and. Uh, not like he was out of breath, but I mean, it was just like, <sighs> you know, and I, I really didn't want to turn all the way around. I really just, I just, I didn't. Uh, and um, I, the thing that helped me, you know, tell myself, talk myself, I was just a big pig, you know, um, it was one of these big wild, wild hogs uh, is the, the, the canine teeth. And it had, uh, they did protrude up over the lips, both lower and upper. I couldn't see any of the smaller, smaller teeth. That was all I could see. He didn't bear his teeth at me or anything like that. Um, it was just a heavy labor breathing. And uh, I, I really didn't have uh, take too, too much time to gather any other features other than uh, he was on all four. Uh, he was quite large, very large. Um, uh, I did see the teeth and, uh, the eye, the eyes seemed to be dark. Uh, they were not, I, I didn't see like, uh, what's this, you know, the, the, the yellow or amber, uh, color, uh, they were just dark eyes, you know, like a, like a, a dark black or brown. Um, and it was early in the morning, you know, it was like seven o'clock in the morning at this point. And so those teeth, I mean, it was just like, I, okay, I could dismiss that, you know, okay, that's just a tusk on a big boar, you know, uh, and I think that helped me to deal with it at that point in time, because, I mean, my mind, I, I just, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, my mind couldn't uh, deal with that. It just, it just, you know, what, what, I, what I was seeing was just, it's something that, that, you know, I don't, I don't even want to use the word werewolf. Uh, you know, and I've never really watched any of the werewolf movies, uh, like, you know, the, the werewolf in London or, or uh, the Van Helsing. I've, I've heard about it, but uh, I've never been a horror film person. And so uh, I really didn't have, what I'm getting at is I really didn't have anything to compare this to other than a big wild boar. Um, and I think that was just easier for me to believe. So I just... I, f I just, you know, I figured, okay, well, whatever's going to happen, if I, if I have to draw, if I have to do something, you know, I'll, I'll do my best, but uh, 
I really don't think there was anything I could have done. And, and even if I did do anything, if I were to draw on it or do make any aggressive move, I think it would have reacted negatively. That, that is my wholehearted thought on that. And so I just elected to do nothing. You know, uh, I, I turned back around, um, still cradling my weapon. And uh, pretty soon the breathing stopped. And eventually I turned around and it, he was gone. The distance... It was a short distance. It was not too far away. Um, it was like, as I'm looking across my apartment here, I mean, it was from the, I mean, you know, I live in a little wooden bedroom. Um, it's probably 25, 30 feet across from wall to wall, from the front door to the back slider. And I, I would guess that'd be a pretty accurate distance if I had to guess. Uh, and I was at a kind of an incline. So, you know, um, it may have actually been shorter than that. I, I really don't know. I, I didn't have a whole lot of time to uh, gather and process all that. And uh, my, my armpits are, are clammy and sweating right now. Just, just, just rehashing that just like earlier when I talked to you, Vic. And so, uh, you know, and it was kind of case I, I knew better than to, to run or anything like that. Uh, you know, a predator is, is going to give chase and it, it just, I really didn't know where he went. And uh, I, I just figured, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, I stayed where I was at, uh, and then pretty soon it was just it was just quiet. Nothing was going on. Figured, okay, well, he went on about his way, and I was getting bored. So I figured, well, um, I've not gone gone to the right uh, further down the river up towards the lake where it comes out of the lake there. So. I figured, you know, I'd go up that way, uh, just a little ways, and um, quite honestly, I wanted to smoke a cigarette and just kind of kind of breathe a little bit, and I wanted to go see if I could uh, scare some ducks up off the water up that way, so, and there was a well, a very well-worn uh, uh, game trail, I guess you could call it, and uh, heading up that way, and so I stayed on that path, and uh the thing about it was, is uh, it was some of the tallest bull thistle that I'd ever seen. And at this point in the year, it was uh, it was mature. Usually, when it's fresh and green, I mean, it's tall and it gets like these spiky uh, flowers. I get the flower on it, I guess, and it's you know the the actual flower when it blooms, kind of kind of a purple color in the middle. But when it when they they're at the end of their their life stage or whatever, they're just a tall, spiky, dry stalk. Uh, the leaves are real spiky, kind of almost like almost like similar to the way a corn plant would look, but with spiky leaves on it. And the flower is, uh, you know, it's dead and uh, brown, and where it would be purple is uh, just like a cotton white color, like a dirty cotton color. And uh, you know, and I'm I'm five eight, um, and the you know this, this bull thistle was was uh, it was taller than I was. Um, I do remember that. And so, um, it was spaced enough to where, I mean, I could see a little ways through it, but it was, you know, I didn't, n not knowing where that, where that, that guy went, you know, uh, I was, I was very aware. I was very, very aware. And I tried to stay pretty focused. Um, and so I pulled out a cigarette and lit that and I was smoking my cigarette and walking up that path. And I ended up going up that path about, uh, maybe a hundred yards, maybe, um, at the most. And, uh, I really hadn't seen anything. And, uh, after I lit that cigarette, I was wearing a hooded sweatshirt and, um, they had that little pouch pocket in the front. And that's where I, I, it's the worst place to put your phone or your keys or your pack of cigarettes. I mean, you go to jog from the car or, uh, bend over. I mean, you drop stuff out. It's just a great way to lose stuff. And, um, uh, well, I wasn't thinking very clear, obviously. So I put my cigarettes in there, and uh, after I got quite a ways down that path, I uh, I need I wanted another cigarette, and so uh, that's when I discovered I dropped my pack of cigarettes. And I I, I was smoking Marvel Reds at the time. And uh, matter of fact, other guys in my company used to tease me about it. You know, that, oh, those are cowboy killers. You know, you need to be smoking these camels and yeah, you know, whatever. I just I, I was a Marvel Red guy. So anyway. Uh, yeah, I dropped those cigarettes, and I'd only, you know, my logic is like, okay, well, I've only traveled one direction, and I stayed on the trail, so, um, and there was nobody else out there. I didn't see, very rarely did I ever see another person out there, every once in a while. So I figured, well, you know, I've gone far enough. I haven't seen no ducks. 
And I was, I, it was just really eerie. It was super quiet. There was no noise uh, other, other than, than whatever was breaking under my feet, little twigs and, and, and dry grass and whatnot. That was like the only noise. It was just still quiet. So I figured, well, you know, I'll find those, those cigarettes on the trail where they, where they dropped, uh, you know, as, as I walked back to my spot. And so, uh, I'd gotten back to, uh, about, mm, 25, 30 yards I, uh, from where I was at. I could see my raft and uh, I still hadn't found those cigarettes. They were gone. And so that blew my mind. Somebody or something seen me drop those cigarettes and it took them or they took them. It was gone. I never did find those cigarettes. Never did. I'm just glad they didn't come back looking for the lighter, you know, on that deal. But, uh, at any rate, at that point, I mean, I, I was ready to, uh, I was ready to go, and uh, I'd had enough. I mean, that pretty much sealed the deal. It just, that's where it just got super. I mean, I, I knew it was time to go, and uh, and so uh, I, I was, I was closing that last bit of distance to my spot, you know, and uh, um. Something caught my eye in the bush there, uh, just kind of stuffed under the bush there. And uh, what it turned out to be when I, when I got close enough to really, um, I'm surprised I didn't notice it on the way in. And what it turned out to be was a, a deer carcass. And it was, it was very fresh. It didn't have any smell of decay or anything. So, I mean, my guess is it was, uh, you know, either there earlier that morning or maybe the, the, the day before, the night before. I mean, it, had, it couldn't have been there long. and uh, the thing about it was, is, uh, and it actually ended up being two deer carcasses because I, you know, I got, I, I noticed the second one and it was, both of them were in a very similar fashion. They were both decapitated and they had been field dressed, they'd been gutted and the genitals were missing. They were both identically done and it was like, in my mind, uh, I'm thinking, okay, poachers, you know, uh, I mean, despite everything that's happened, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to come up with explanations, you know, and uh, so, yeah, poachers. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what happened to the cigarettes. You know, someone's been watching me. I've been under a scope. I'm like, holy smokes, you know. So, you know, I was looking at that and the way it was done, I mean, it, it was done so well that, yeah, I mean, I would assume that a human being did that with a tool, you know, like a knife. But the meat wasn't touched. I mean, the hide was still on it. And it was just kind of uh, drug up under underneath these in the edge of this thicket, you know, and uh, not too far actually from from where I was set up with my decoys and stuff. And uh, I, I guess I just wasn't wanting to really accept the situation, what was really going on, you know. And uh, it was just either to, easier to make up my own uh, story on that deal. And so it was time to go. And at that point, you know, I. I Maybe I did kind of realize, but it was just, it was hard to accept. And, uh, I wasn't going to walk back, back that distance. Uh, I was not willing to walk back the same. I, I, because like I said, I don't know where this thing went. I just knew there's, okay, there's two fresh deer kills. My cigarettes, I dropped them. Uh, I'm the only one out here. They're gone. Not to mention this thing walked up, you know, right behind me. I mean, regardless, it wasn't aggressive towards me, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's time to go. So. What I did was, is uh, I didn't bother to pick up my decoys. I, I put the raft in the water, and me and my me and my weapon, and that was it. You know, I hopped in, in the raft and paddled out into that slough through the middle of it, and hit the hit the main body of the river there, and uh, hung hung a left uh, out around that that finger where I'd seen the uh, the two younger ones uh, having that fight earlier in the year, and uh, and like things, you know, things weren't worse enough. You know, I got a little ways out, to, uh, pretty much in front of where I'd seen those um, uh, those ones that had been fighting, and I yelled at, and uh, I somehow I, I there got got a hole in the, in, the, in the raft, and it was starting to talk go and, and deflate, and uh, I, I I had no choice but to go ashore. That was just the way it was. It was either that or go swimming, and it was just it's too cold, and so. Uh, I made it ashore roughly in that same area and the way it was is like, I left the raft there too. You know, I, it just me and my, me and my weapon. And, uh, 
And I walked through there and it was like, there was a bunch of dead trees. I could see where the limbs had been busted off. The ground was quite disturbed. There were tracks. There was a lot of evidence there, but uh, I was not wanting to stay in that area. And so eventually I, I did make the distance on foot without any, any other incident. And uh, I got back to my vehicle and then uh, boom, there's game warden pulls up. There's this game warden and the uh, young guy and uh, not much, you know, he's probably in his early twenties, I would guess, you know, and, uh, and I had just experienced all this, you know, and so I attempted to hold myself together and, uh, you know, I, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. I, I had my hunt license on me and, and uh, I knew I was within uh, uh, regulations. So he asked me, uh, you know, you know, see me at the shotgun. I said, yeah, I was out here duck hunting and everything. And, and uh, you know, he asked to check my license. And so I produced that and checked that and, and uh, asked to check my weapon and, and uh, the way it is when you're duck hunting, you know, uh, you're only allowed to have uh, three shells in your shotgun and, uh, and, and the, the shotgun can't be capable. It has to have a capacity reducer in the magazine, the tube magazine, um, is a pump action shotgun, uh, that, uh, makes it incapable of, of, uh, you know, accommodating more than three rounds. And, uh, so uh, I guess it's to give the, give the, the game, you know, the, the ducks, uh, a fair chance or something, you know, I really don't know what the logic is on that, but, uh, that's the way it was. And so we checked the weapon, everything was good. And, uh, you know, I, I know, I know law enforcement is trained to pick up on certain things and I'm, I'm certain that that was the case. He could tell someone, right. You know, he could tell someone's wrong. And, uh, I was pretty nervous and everything. And, you know, it was like the more questions he asked, you know, and it was just like, I didn't tell him everything. I, I certainly didn't tell him everything. I mean, I really didn't know how, you know, I didn't know. I mean, the best description I could have gave him is, is yeah, you got werewolves out here. I knew what I saw and uh, whether I wanted to accept it for myself or not. But I mean, to try to describe that to another person, much less a law enforcement officer, fishing game, what have you. And uh, so I went ahead and told him that I thought there were some poachers back there. And uh, that I felt like, you know, I told him about the cigarettes uh, and I felt like uh, someone see me drop them uh, and pick them up, you know, and that I felt that I was under a scope and that I did find those two deer that had been field dressed out and, uh, and decapitated and, and hidden under bushes, you know, and he said he wasn't surprised at that, but he, he had, uh, had a feeling something like that may have been going on back there is what he said. And he asked if I'd be willing to, you know, take him back in there and show him where it was at. And I, I really did not want to do that. I really did not want to do that. And, uh, I certainly wasn't going back in there on foot. I just, I wasn't going to do it. And, um, at any rate, he said, look, you know, we will hop in my truck and we'll drive in there. And I'll unlock the gate and you can show me where it's at. And uh, I, I, I feel a lot of guilt looking. I mean, I, to an extent, I mean, I do. I feel guilty. I feel like I, I denied the guy some really need to know information, you know, by not telling him all of the story. But, you know, we got back in there and I showed him what was going on there and what I found and, and just the general direction. I didn't go any further on the trail or anything like that. I was not, I wasn't going to go any further, you know, and, um, and he mentioned that, uh, something to the effect that, you know, he was going to, he would probably at a later date dress in full camouflage and, and stake that out back there. And I mean, part of me wanted to tell him, I wanted to tell him, you know, Hey man, you need to be careful about, you know, and, and don't go by yourself. You know I mean? But the more I think about it and, and uh, the way I feel about it, I think he knew when he said that he had a feeling something like that was going on back there. I think he knew more than he was leading on as well, you know, as far as, as what had happened. I think that, uh, I think he pretty well knew. And, uh, I think he, he was very well aware of, uh, that those are out there and, and, and that was it. You know, if we left, we went out of there and I, I got in my car and left. I've, I've not ever gone back to that area, uh, since, you know, well, obviously, I mean, I, I don't reside in Texas anymore either. So yeah. And, and, and that was pretty much it, but, uh, you know, and I just, I, you know, and it's one of those things that, uh, I've worked so hard at not remembering. It's just one of those things that you, uh, you stuff deep down in you, you know, and you hope that it never sees the light of day. And I, I worked hard at that for nearly 20 years, you know, and, uh, 
I mean, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how, how, how to tell somebody, you know, it's not that I didn't want to tell somebody about it. I didn't really know how to tell somebody about that. I was more uh, afraid of, uh, you know, the reaction or not being believed or uh, made fun of, or, you know, you, you name it. I'm sure many could add to that list. And then there came a point in time where I was actually, I was actually at my mother's house just a couple of years back, as a matter of fact. And, uh, she had gotten a new laptop computer and, uh, you know, we were doing the YouTube thing, just looking up random stuff. And, and now, now that, uh, you know, I live, I live in the Pacific Northwest, you know, uh, really interested in Bigfoot and that kind of thing. And so we were looking up stuff, you know, where we could find on Bigfoot and, um, you know, this dog man thing popped up. Uh, I, I never heard of the term dog man until that time. And, uh, and it was interesting, you know, uh, uh, it was interesting. So I went ahead and checked it out a little bit and it's pretty creepy. And, uh, I, I didn't really think too much of it, uh, until, you know, I became kind of addicted to it, if you will. You know, I mean, the more I listened to different guests encounters, uh, the more I was able to kind of relate. I'm just like, wow, you know, uh, I've seen something similar to that description, you know, I'm just like, oh man. And uh, not still not really wanting to, you know, I didn't even want to admit it to myself. I didn't even want to really go there. But, I mean, it, it reached a certain point where I, I had heard a specific guest share uh, their encounter. And uh, that was episode 251. And uh, it was uh, a nice lady that uh, lived out in that same same area. And uh, at that point in time, and, it, you know, what she described and uh, – I mean, the glove fit, you know, it was to a T and I, I, I couldn't deny it anymore. And, um, I had wrote notes. I considered contacting Vic several times and it was just, it, it was tough to do. It was tough to, to reach out there and, and be vulnerable and to take a chance. And, uh, I'm glad I did, but, uh, what I'd really like to say if, if it wasn't for D in uh, episode 251, I probably would not have come forward and, uh, and shared this tonight so i'm very grateful to her and i'd just like to say thank you for her uh having the courage to to share her encounter you know it helps others and i i just i hope that mine helps somebody else too and uh you know i, I that's pretty much it those were the four encounters i think that you know i mean my personal feeling on it is yeah they're absolutely 100 percent flesh and blood real biological animal they're just another one of God's creations, another one of God's creatures. And, uh, I mean, they have a right to live and exist just like we do. I'm grateful that, uh, there, there was no violence or, uh, you know, any kind of, I'm, I'm just glad it wasn't any worse than it was. And it, the only thing that, uh, really lost out of that deal other than the innocence in my mind, my peace of mind, uh, for a while, uh, was that pack of cigarettes, you know, and that it didn't come back wanting the light or something. I mean, not to be funny, but serious, you know, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. It's ironic that you mentioned Dee from episode 251, Heath, because she actually wrote me today to let me know about an encounter she had the other day with the dog man. So yeah, it's pretty ironic. She's still having encounters with them. Oh, wow. Bless her heart. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a coincidence. I, I don't know what the odds of that are, but wow. That's all I can say on that. I, I'm very, well, and I'm very grateful to you too, Vic, you know, uh, for what it was worth, I went ahead and, and uh, submitted that encounter, and I was only able to go into so much detail. You know, I mean, I'm I'm, sw I'm sweating bullets right now. I mean, my my armpits are sweating. I'm just, you know, it's it, I'm quite nervous. You know, and it, it's it is it's tough. You know, and uh, but I mean, I was able to do that, and uh, you you got back to me a lot quicker than than I. I mean, I don't know what I really expected anyway, but um, all expectations aside, I mean got back to me very quick and uh was able to talk to you and um you know i just really appreciate your your willingness and uh you getting back to me so quick and, and allowing me to come here tonight and, and and share this with folks you know so thank you as well Dave. oh you know you're welcome i'm just glad to be in a position where i can help so yeah glad to do it Heath, unfortunately, your audio is cracking and popping. It wasn't doing this in sound check. I'm not sure what the problem is, but because it's giving us fits, we're going to make this kind of short here. Whereas I would normally have several questions to throw at you, 
I'm just going to throw a couple at you, then we're going to get out of here. Having said that, the first question I wanted to ask you is, when those first two dogmen walked to the edge of that clearing where they were fighting and stared at you, how close were they to you at that point? Well, I'm, I'm guessing uh, the length across that slough there from where I was positioned is a good 30 yards. You know, and they walk to the edge of that. So I, I would say 30 yards is pretty accurate. I mean, as far as a guesstimate, I would say 30 yards. That's pretty close. That's definitely too close for comfort. After seeing them, though, why in the world did you go back? Was it curiosity? Because to me, that's what it sounds like. Don't get me wrong. I've done a lot of dumb things in my life. And uh, I mean, I, I really don't know. But uh at that point in time, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think I was more curious than anything. And, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing what I love to do. You know, I mean, it'd be no different than, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes I go out on the, on the Pacific Ocean in a 10 foot kayak, uh, not too far out, you know, just around the, the rocks and stuff, uh, fishing for link cod and rockfish and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, great white sharks live there. And it's just like, you know, it's one of those things that's in, it's, it's possible. It could happen. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to let something like that prevent me from going out and doing what I love to do. And uh, I guess it just didn't scare me enough the, the first initial time. Uh, maybe it should have. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I was curious. I mean, it was certainly different, to put it lightly. But uh, I guess I just it didn't scare me enough. And even if it did, I mean, eventually I, I'd have been uh, – I'd have, gone, I'd have gone back out, but I just a, a, after that last encounter, that, that was enough. That was enough, and uh, I deemed it just not in my best interest. I wasn't going to push it, you know, and uh, I pushed it far enough on that deal, I think. So I do realize the outcome could have been much different, and I'm, I'm grateful that uh, I'm grateful for the outcome that did come come of it, and uh, not the alternative. So I, I guess that's the uh, best answer I can give you on that, big. You know, Heath. In sales, there's an old saying, and that saying goes, you are not your customer. What I'm getting at here is that saying basically tells you that because you would or would not do a certain thing, that doesn't mean that someone else would not go back out there a second time. So, yeah, that's what I'm getting at here. Just because people at home listening, for most of them, they would never go out that second time the way you did, that's got no bearing on whether you would or someone else out there would. No bearing whatsoever. But having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I, I just, I just hope you know my experience goes to benefit others, and it's just you know if you do go out, try to use your discernment and uh, be aware. You know, be aware. I mean, these things are absolutely out there. I can personally guarantee you that they're certainly in Texas. And, you know, I understand that they're in a lot of other states as well. But, you know, it just goes to show you there's there's a large percentage of things that we haven't discovered yet. And it's just, you know, be cautious, be be aware of what you're doing out there. And if you can manage, take a buddy, you know, go with somebody. And uh, it's probably not the best idea to go out alone like that. That's good advice. Well, thanks so much for coming on and sharing the details of those encounters with us. I really appreciate it. Likewise, Vic. I'm, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Oh, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.